<laughs> well, first of all, I greet you all in the name of the Creator, the Most High, Jah! I greet you in the name of His Imperial Majesty, Kedamawi Haile Selassie, in the name of our beloved Empress, Menem Asfal. I greet the sky that covers us, the earth that supports us. I give greetings to all of our ancestors, those who have gone before us. I give greetings to the Mother Whenua of this place. And I greet you. <coughs> it's a real uh, honour to be here, and I want to thank Robbie for organising today. I think it's been a really awesome opportunity to hear a lot of very deep corridor from a variety of awesome speakers. And this kind of opportunity is a real one, so I really give thanks for the opportunity to be here and listen and to participate. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers who have gone before, who have given such awesome presentations, and I've learned so much from each corridor. Um, ngā, ngā hiwi, and, um, and I want to mihi get it to you for the, for the work that you've done over many years, and, you know, um, and the sounds that I used to hear when I was a youth, that really inspired, you know, and now I'm grey, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really awesome. To Tingi and the knowledge of, um, oh, and, and, and you know, the, the Kopa of Māori in relation to reggae, really, really awesome. To Tingi, to, you know, the knowledge of those early days of reggae and growing up as a Polynesian, you know, as a Pacific Islander in Auckland, and, um, and, and your journey is a really inspirational thing to hear, so I thank you for that. Um, to Dubhead, you know, awesome about the sound system, a lot of really good information there that I didn't know, and so it's really awesome to hear that. Uh, to Miriama. Um, for you know, bringing that really solid 12 tribes perspective <coughs> and, and you know, enlightening us about all of that. So I thank you for that. Very powerful. Um, Tuduia, wherever he went. Um, you know, very powerful, very powerful uh, call. And uh, to learn all that about, um, about Ratana and the connections with Marcus Garvey was a, was a really new thing. So really awesome. And last of all, to Dennis, who put it down to <laughs> to Dennis, thank you so much, brother, for um, you know really bringing uh, a really heartfelt message that's really inspired and filled us all up with hope. So I give thanks for that. And that really sets the stage for what I wanted to talk about, because um, I guess what I want to talk about is, uh, in some ways, the failing of reggae music and of the Rastafari movement in Aotearoa. And so I'm talking about reggae muzak and the commodification of, of Rasta. And I'm going to start with a quotation from Lee Scratch Perry when he came here to, to play some years ago and they interviewed him on the TV and they said, what do, you think of, you know, what do you think about modern reggae? And he said, reggae is a mad dog. And I was like, eh? And uh, it took me a long time to really think through what he meant by that. But, you know, there's a lot of serious Rasta who burn reggae music, you know. And, um, and I think the relationship between reggae music and Rasta is a really ambivalent one. And it's a really contentious one. And it's good to, be, to, to know about it. It's, an, it's a unique relationship as well because, you know, Rastafari is the only um, faith and spiritual movement which has a modern uh, musical form which is distinctly its own. Christianity is, you know, like Western Christianity is co-opted heavy metal and rap and different things and tried to, to, to bring the youth in. But reggae is really the only <coughs> spiritual movement which has its own modern form of music. So it's, it's a really unique thing. Um, but as I say, it's an ambivalent thing and the things intertwine because you see very conscious reggae, this, the, you know, the original roots reggae and then all the kind of lovers rock stuff happened and it was like it had nothing to do with Rasta. And then, you know, and then there's been these different waves that have come and gone. Uh, yeah, and so, um, and I think there was a kind of a synchronicity, you know, that happened in the early days of, of Roots Reggae, like R Reggae was a musical development, but I think what made it um, different was it had this, that it went to Rastafari for its foundation, and so Rasta didn't come out of Reggae, and Reggae didn't really come out of Rasta, but the two joined in a moment in history. And so Mortimo Plano, one of the, one of the um, esteemed elders of Jamaica, talks about when Bob Marley used to come to visit him for reason, you know, and he would inspire him and talk to him and reason with him and deepen his knowledge of Rasta. And he said his, his hope was always that Bob Marley would take control of his own kind of recording, take control of the industry. And so reggae music 
you know, reggae artists would stop being ripped off by big labels and these kinds of things. So people like Mortimer Clamo were there right in the beginning of, of the development of Rasta. Um, and, you know, and reggae artists growing up around the Nyabingi camp, so you listen to those roots reggae, and often what you're hearing is Nyabingi chants that have been translated into reggae music. And that's why that stuff is so deep, because it's founded on a deep river of ancient wisdom that has expressed itself through the Rastafari movement. Uh, and in return, of course, reggae gave Rasta a worldwide audience. So, like, I would... I may have never heard the word of Rastafari if it wasn't for Bob Marley and other reggae artists who took this out, you know. And the journey of I and I, even though in Jamaica a lot of the elders, Bingy and Boba Shanti and others, really burn, as I say, burn reggae, those of us in the wider world, we have to give thanks because it was through the growth of reggae music that I and I even heard the word of Rastafari. And so um, it's a blessing, you know, that people like Bob Marley came here, even though it was contentious in Jamaica at the time. It was contentious among Rasta. You know, so the two, it was a symbiotic kind of thing. And of course, reggae music and the, rust, the message of Rasta that it's brought has been incredibly important for international history. Because, the, because Rastafari has inspired, and reggae has inspired freedom fighters all around the world. So in South Africa, when the ANC was fighting a civil war against the violent apartheid regime, on the underground illegal radio station broadcasting from Angola, they were playing Bob Marley. And reggae artists, and that's who was that's who was inspiring fighters with Amkanto West this way, you know. Mm. And here in Aotearoa, and you know, in the Polynesian Panthers and the, the you know the Tinoranga Tiritanga movement, which was so strongly influenced around the Pacific, all over Africa. This is the the international context for this thing, because it was a militant philosophy. It was an anti-corporate philosophy. It was an anti-colonial philosophy, and so it related to the struggles for freedom for people all around the world. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, so, so, so and it was important in the Tinoranga Tintang movement, and Ngahui kind of brought that out really strongly, you know, but I remember listening to early reggae music in this country, Dread, Beat and Blood, Sticks and Shanty, Mana, Aotearoa, people, you know, and it was like, that was, again, militant, conscious reggae music, and I still believe, despite the fact that um, reggae today is often more musically accomplished. For me, in many ways, some of the best reggae produced in this country as ever was in those times because of the spirit that it brought, a really direct, uh, you know, really direct connection to that Rasta vibe, I think. Because I say that today we don't have that very much. And there are exceptions, there are some really conscious reggae bands internationally and in Aotearoa. But to me, a lot of the reggae that I'm hearing coming out of Aotearoa today is kore kaupapa. It's kore kaupapa Māori, it's kore kaupapa Rastafari. <coughs> it's without any kaupapa or foundation. It's just music. And so the Hawaiian brothers, you know, that we heard about, um, you know, that's not just from Hawaii. We're, seeing, we're hearing that in our own um, Aotearoa reggae as well. You know, so that's why I call it muzak, because it's the kind of music you can hear in the elevator or in the aeroplane and the plane lands, or in the coffee shop, or in the shoe shop. And in fact, that's exactly where I hear a lot of the music. You know? And even, in fact, even Bob Marley, I remember going into a shop to buy some shoes, and they were playing Bob Marley on the sound system in the shoe shop. You know? But of course, it's the Legends album. Not an album he ever put out in his lifetime. It was a compilation of you know, great stuff, but it's all, you know, could you be love, one love, it's, it's great stuff, but you know, the man produced so much militant stuff, and most people who hear Bob Marley, they've only ever heard the one album, you know, of his most, um, of his easiest, the easiest stuff to listen to. And, you know, and I think a lot of the reggae that we're hearing today is like that, internationally and in Aotearoa as well, you know. Because, um, you know, we don't hear Bob Marley singing Burning and Looting, you know, which again is a relevant, you know, it's kind of timely kind of association. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a few things that I think, that, that I think it, the reason for that. One is I think commercial success has created its own difficulties because if, if people can make money out of reggae music, then, then the reasons why people come to make reggae re music change for some of them. And so commercial you know, success is its own danger, of course. 
Um, but I think there's a couple of social developments which I think are really important in this. And one is what's happened with the Tinoranga Tiritanga movement, and the, one, the other one is what's happened with the Rastafari movement in this country. And, um, and I think that because reggae is a, as someone said before, it's an expression of the people who play it. So if, if, uh, if, if the, the, the kind of context out of which that music is being made has changed, then the music will change, you know. Um, you know, because if the music's been made without a connection, as someone said before, to the uh, puna matauranga, you know, to that stream of knowledge, if it's, if it's made without that connection, it won't have that knowledge. And it's not the fault of necessarily the people who are making the music, it's just that the social context has changed. So if I look at the Tenoranga Teletanga movement, you know, again, I think it's also been in some ways a victim of its own success. Uh, because, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, when the, the struggle was to reclaim Te Reo Māori and to, and to uh, you know, have control over some resources, the target was fairly simple to define. But I look at you know, young Māori today, and I don't see the same kind of political engagement in general. And I think one of the reasons is very hard to define the targets. You know, the, the, the reo is not safe, but it's like, you know, there's kōhanga reo, there's kura uh, kaupapa, there's whare wānana. The language is developed. There's Māori TV, there's Māori radio stations. And so the targets are, unclear, uh, are less clear. And so if you look around young Māori today, um, you don't see the same kind of, I think, collective political activity as, as we saw a decade or two ago. And so if the young people aren't involved in the political movement, then they're not expressing that in the music. The, the treaty settlement process has been a very dangerous thing in many respects because it's co-opted a lot of iwi leadership. You know, so money has come in and, um, you know, and then it's like, well, you know, sure, Māori, you can have resources as long as you play our game. You play, and you play it under our terms. And a lot of people are uh, prepared to go, yeah, we'll do that. You know, we'll play the game. And so, so there's a massive co-option. And of course, the, 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 the treaty settlement process also is deliberately constructed to divide iwi internally and between themselves <coughs> because of the way that the, the settlement is with large natural groupings and, you know, and all these kinds of things. So there's a co-option that's happened with the, with the settlement process. And the other thing is, in a way, it's a maturing of the movement because a lot of people were, were like talking, talking an ideology and there was like the realisation, oh, well, actually, we have to go back home and implement these things in the ground. So a lot of people are way back home implementing Tinoranga Tiratanga in their local areas. But what that means is that the national connections are harder to make and sometimes aren't being made. And all these things, I think, means that um, the reggae music that's being made is, is, is seldom today an expression of kaupapa mai in, in, a, in a kind of political sense. Um, and of course, I think the same is true of, uh, of what's happened in terms of the Rastafari movement in Aotearoa as well. You know, one of the difficulties we have in this country is we only have really one mansion that exists, one mansion of Rastafari that exists in the country, which is the 12 tribes of Israel. And I pay respect for the 12 tribes for carrying the banner for decades in this country and spreading the word of Rastafari in this country. But to me it's a regret that we don't have a Naya Bengi house in Aotearoa and we don't have a Bobo Shanti house. And in fact many people, if they know Rastafari, have never heard of the Naya Bengi house or the Bobo Shanti house or the other houses of Rastafari. So we don't know the history of Rastafari in general in this country. You know, so there's three main houses and there are others, but there's three main houses of Rastafari. 